A uh, very, very good evening. A warm welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pick and Pay. And welcome to a rather different evening for Dan Really Likes Wine. Normally, it's a, a fairly light-hearted look at the world of wine, tasting a bottle or two with assorted winemakers or producers or lovers of wine, which is a fairly broad and happily so category. But today we do something a little bit different because the wine industry in South Africa is under siege yet again. The broader alcohol industry, we're in the throes of a third ban. The first one hit hard, the second one hit harder, and the third, I fear, may well be crippling for many people of an industry that is far broader than we often imagine. I've referenced once or twice in the last week an article on the Wines of South Africa website by Melu Lambert, taking us beyond just the winemaker or the wine seller and going into spaces like a charity project, such as the Pebbles Project in the Himalanada Valley, where the local winemakers are supporting an organization that allows kids to get to school, that allows the local community to flourish as it otherwise <laughs> probably would not. And so the impact of this ban is not simply that you or I can no longer nip down to pick and pay for a couple of bottles of Chardonnay and a magnum of Shiraz. It is that uh, a really big chunk of the South African economy is currently in paralysis and the knock-on effect of that is absolutely massive. And so I thought about this and I thought, well, even I probably can't change that in just one hour online, but there are a lot of people I can talk to, people who know far more about the wine industry, about the liquor trade than I do, who collectively uh, can put their voices together and we can try and look at how we can address this space because it's clearly not something that's going to go away overnight. It is low hanging fruit in terms of government looking at ways to address the pandemic and the impacts of it. And so the alcohol industry, although I feel is being unfairly blamed for uh, far more than it's actually responsible for here, is going to need to be proactive in terms of trying to find a way back into the good books of government and ensuring that such a big, such a crucial, such a vibrant industry in South Africa can emerge from a state of paralysis and get back to doing what it does so well, which is making South Africa proud and putting fabulous wine in particular into glasses all over the world. So I've got a terrific collection of guests who I'd like to welcome in uh, in no particular order. Miraculously, Ruben Riffle is not on the golf course this afternoon. He's not just one of South Africa's finest chefs, he's one of the world's best. He's a good mate of mine and his restaurant business has seen firsthand the impact of the liquor ban. We also have Siobhan Thompson. Uh, Siobhan uh, runs Wines of South Africa. She's the CEO there. And they continue to do such a fabulous job around the world showcasing South African wine and uh, making the world realize that the very best wine on the planet does come from South Africa. And that is a completely completely objective view. Uh, Rico Besson also with us. I wouldn't want to be Rico over the last year or so. It's been a very tough job running VinPro, representing our vineyards and our wine industry and trying so hard to get the industry back up and running in what we know are such difficult times. Uh, we've also got uh, two uh, further guests who will be joining us uh, very shortly. We're just waiting for them to come online. Uh, but while that happens, uh, let's kick off, if I may, uh, with Rico, just to set the scene. Uh, and uh, without uh, uh, without getting completely gloomy, and it might be hard not to, uh, paint a picture for us, uh, Rico, if you will, in terms of the impact that this ban has had on the wine industry in South Africa, the numbers we're looking at and, and just how destructive it's actually been. Dan, thank you very much and thanks for the invite. Yeah, I'll keep uh, to steer away from numbers because I'm a, I am an economist. But look, it's I wrote down the words dire, I wrote, wrote down uncertain um, and, and I think pressure. And, and the reason for that is that the industry and, and, and because it's an agricultural industry that adds value, is not built for stop-start that we are experiencing. It, it, it's got fairly long planning cycles. So uh, I think the numbers are well documented. Um, over the last year, 12 months, we only traded uh, two out of the three days. Other, to say it otherwise, we were closed for 18 weeks now in the local market. And the five weeks of exports, um, Siobhan could talk to problems at Harbour, et cetera. And, and it's been a difficult and frustrating relationship with government. Um, and once again, I need to give context to that because as, a, as an industry, we're probably one of the most regulated industries 
But because it's such an extensive value chain, we deal with we deal on a daily basis with 11 different government departments. And I think therein lies at least two of the challenges. Number one, uh, you need to make sure that everybody is informed. And then number two, within COVID, uh, the message sometimes get lost um, up to the COVID council and they not always make rational decisions. So I think it's fair to say that we are frustrated um, it's fair to say that whilst we understood the two-week ban up till the 15th of Jan, I now call where we are a fourth ban, uh, rightly or wrongly. And the fact that there is no certainty when we will open up uh, and the harvest is due next week makes it very challenging. So I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about the huge stock levels and, and some of the alternatives um, but it's tough out there, Dan. Um, good export results. Siobhan will talk to that. But that unfortunately doesn't make up for losses, which is now in excess of 8 billion rand. And then I exclude the losses uh, in things like restaurants and downstream and, and, and job losses, which is now exceeding 20,000. So let me stop there. It is, it is dire. And um, let's talk to the solutions also. It is a gloomy picture, but we do have to find those solutions, and, and you're absolutely right. Just extending the image, though, of the challenge, uh, Ruben, as a restaurateur, the percentage of the earnings that you make, the turnover that you have in your various restaurants, and I've lost count of quite how many of them there are at the moment, uh, is not insignificant when it comes to the sale of alcohol in general and wine in particular, especially for someone in France, one of the, the finest wine areas we have. How much of an impact does the alcohol ban have on you? How much has it hurt your business? And by extension, the people that you employ, uh, the jobs that you create, and the, the, the vibrant part of that Francia community that also serves as such a strong tourism lure. Hi, Dan. Also, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I, I suppose I can use some of Rico's words there, and I think Dyer was one of them that he, that he uh, brought in there. You know, I mean, after the first lockdown, I, I thought... Um, I think we were all uh, for that uh, initially, I suppose. Um, but little did we know that it would come back again. You know, we had a run up to sort of uh, our tourist season where things gradually sort of improved. Um, um, and then uh, just sort of like as we were starting to to really almost get, get back to a level where we felt like, okay, we, we're making a, a, a few gains now. The second sort of um, ban was really detrimental. I, I spoke to a lot of my colleagues as well. Um, you know, as you know, Chris, uh, New Year's Eve is also one of our Christmas and New Year's Eve is one of our biggest evenings, mm -hmm. uh, not just here down in the Cape, but, but in most restaurants. Unfortunately, a lot of our people cancelled. I mean, uh, okay, that paired together with uh, I think the travel ban at that stage. Um, a lot of our customers that come from the UK, and Germany. Uh, you know, parts of Europe, uh, and now um, kind of like the beginning of the year and after the 15th of January, um, we've just seen a significant decline in, in our customers. And obviously that leads to us having to look at how we can keep our business running and how we can still keep it going. I mean, we don't see when this will end. Uh, it's unfortunate to say that, you know, we've we've had to let some of our people go. We were slowly but surely re-employing some of our people that uh, were sitting sitting home. Um, a lot of those people we have to let go. And uh, if it continues like this, I think we're going to have to make even more cuts. And that's a reality, not only for my restaurants, but, but for uh, all over. I think we're already in a position where we were trying to claw back uh, and uh, this has just put us way back again. I mean, and um, uh, initially, obviously, we had uh, tourists that we could apply for for our staff, but now there's nothing, you know, there's nothing, nowhere that we can look uh, for, for uh, any assistance for, for our businesses. Uh, not uh, not a cheery situation. I was reading a story, I think, this morning about La Tete, uh, one of my favorite restaurants down on yeah. the Cape, which 
closing its doors in February. I've seen La Mouette is up for sale. A number of our restaurants up here playing golf with a mutual friend of ours, David Higgs, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Ruben, he was uh, talking about the pressure his restaurants are under as two of the bigger and more established in Johannesburg. It all makes it really, really tough. And I, I, I want to look at the reasons behind this ban. Uh, we're hoping to have uh, uh, Sabani Nadi with us in just a moment uh, to uh, to give us his perspective on that. Uh, but Shivana, just not so much from your uh, wines of South Africa perspective, but just your general understanding of the wine industry. You've been part of it for so long in, in many different spaces. Uh, I think we get the feeling that we sort of know why initially there were some good reasons for looking at a ban, but the extent to it, the, the baby going out with the bathwater or the, the wine going out with the cork, it, it has been I think just a, a real sense of overkill, and and you wonder, uh, yeah, just just how thoroughly all of this has been thought through, and whether there is the science to it, or, or whether it is a this is a great example we can make of an industry, and and hopefully distract from some of the other challenges we're facing. I think I think it's a, it's, it's quite an interesting thing that you're saying. There is, you know, overkill. Has it been looked at in terms of um, the lifestyle product and how we would benefit from people going and enjoying wine and creatively exploring um, the offerings with it? So I think it's been it, wine has been banded with everything else and seen as um, an issue. But I think that there is room, obviously, to look at that. And and one of the saddest things about all of this is is linked to the tourism aspect of of closing down these offerings for tourists. A lot of tourists go to a wine farm, for instance, to experience the food with the wine um, and to have an, have an overall experience. And when these alcohol bans hit South Africa, those tourists don't want to go. And, you know, Ruben was saying he's had people cancel going to his restaurants um, because of the curfew time and also because they can't have wine with their meals. And for me, that's really short-sighted because the government has said to us we can now export after the five-week ban. Um, but these people coming to South Africa and experiencing um, the wine tourism offerings, so the tastings, buying the wine, um, having the food with the wine, go back and become our ambassadors. They go back and they tell everyone else about South African wine, about brand South Africa. Um, and so it grows. And so then people will buy wine overseas. And I think that for us is critical, cutting off that marketing aspect of brand South Africa and South African wine. So I think it hasn't been looked at um, from that aspect. Um, and for me, that's, that's hugely concerning. Rick, the, the point that Siobhan makes there in terms of the, the wine farms, getting these people in, getting people in to come and eat at the wine farms, to come and taste their cheese, to come and explore them as more than just somewhere that gives them a glass of wine. They really are tourist destinations. That is hitting our wine estates as well. In terms of getting through this and then moving on going forward, how many, if uh, maybe not an exact number, but uh, to what degree is the industry facing a point where large chunks of it simply aren't going to be able to make it back. Yeah, uh, if, before I comment on that, Dan, um, I, I think we have passed that point where we, um, there will be a structural change. I, I just think certain businesses, unfortunately, will not be here uh, for very much longer. And, and, and yes, others will come back. But it, it's going to take, without any assistance, it's going to take, it's going to take very long. Um, I want to come back to the point of, of, of tourists, I mean, perhaps to a positive, I, I always say uh, the one thing that we do have um, in, in South Africa is our world-class tourism um, offer. And I think I think the way we do it is, is is not only, and you said earlier, we are we are the destination, we are. Um, we, we sell a million bottles of wine every day of the year all over the world. And that is, it's one of the best ambassadors for the country. Mm. Um, and people that come and visit, and we know when they come in, um, the internationals spend at least two days uh, touring wine country, dining out, um, and then they spend in excess of 40,000, 50,000 those two days. So, so that's gone. Um, suddenly, if you are a farm, and, and another perspective perhaps is these wine farms that we have, there, there are 533 um, 400 of them are really micro enterprises, which means they are they are fairly small. Small would be a turnover of below 10 million rand. 
and they are highly highly reliant on direct sales which is the tourism and, and is the hospitality and is the, the, the restaurant sector and i think that is where that is where the challenge lies that without the tourist without uh, the restaurant offering tastings that's gone and and suddenly they do not have the financial stability to um, to 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 um, go, go forward and be viable. We've done a couple of things. I think I think um, one of the things that that we've done now for tourism is we we got a grant of twelve million rand from the Western Cape government, um, where we at least were able to help tasting room uh, personnel. We wine farms could apply and, and we could help up to 10 people for three months. It's the same as a TERS subsidy. Um, so that helps, but but the damage uh, is done and, and, and then it's going to take us years, uh, I think, to recover. So that's a bit of context. By by extension, all of this, 12 million rand is, uh, is very helpful, but it's certainly a very small percentage of the amount of money that has been lost whether it's the Western Cape government where the majority of our wine is found or national government as a whole. I know you've got 11 departments to wrestle with probably more than engage with. How, how freely do you feel those conversations are going? How much do you feel the people who are making these decisions truly understand the impact that those decisions are having? It's an interesting, it's an interesting comment. Um, and I, and I actually said, I told someone this morning, um, that that the topic that we don't talk about is is the poverty trap that people are going into South Africa. I mean, it's it's almost like these job losses in the private sector. Government doesn't understand it, or they don't care for the short term. Um, but if we talk about the healthcare pressure that we have now, can you just think what's going to happen with with poverty and 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 that need in a couple of years' time? So. So no, I don't. I don't think um, that uh, people in government understand uh, the complexity of a wine value chain. Um, one of the things that came out when we had the, you'll remember, in in April we could export, and ten days later the Minister of Transport decided that we couldn't transport wine to the harbour, and, and we had a discussion. And then we realized in that discussion, um, government don't know how wine gets to the harbor or how it gets to Europe. And, and we had to explain that it, it goes into a container. There's a truck driver, there's a forklift driver. It's got all the protocols. So, so that kind of thing, which might be logical to us as wine people, isn't, isn't as logical. And, and therefore you've got this knee jerk uh, approach. Um, Dan, Another comment is, is, yes, I feel very strong that alcohol um, is a problem. The alcohol misuse is a problem, but, but the context and the narrative is also skewed. I think alcohol is, is being made the scapegoat. And I want to say two things about this. Um, number one, 60%, 60% of South Africans are teetotalers. They don't drink any alcohol which means that there is a minority who are binge drinkers. And, and the way to approach this is not a blanket ban. It, it's like 100 years ago, we could learn from the prohibition in America. We will not have a different result. All that happens is that where illicit trade was one in every four liters before COVID, it's now obviously double that, one in every three liters. So you need to address this with education, you need to address this with targeted intervention. And we as an industry has gone to government to say, and we will cut off the supply where you have hotspots um, and we will cut off and we, we, will, we will blame and shame where license um, conditions are broken. And we've done that. We've, we've done more than 160 of those in the Western Cape only. Hospitals, the narrative on trauma units, um, I understand and I think um, I've got all the empathy um, that, that we've got a challenge, but our own empirical data shows that the curfew of nine o'clock had a far bigger impact on trauma units than alcohol. The lack of gatherings had a far bigger correlation with that. So I'm not trying to get out of the alcohol challenge we face. I'm just saying that the media 
and government is projecting a very, very skewed picture out there. And I think that's up to us to set the record straight and uh, get government to partner. That was exactly the point that I know uh, Sabani Mladi would have made with us. He's uh, struggling to get online at the moment. I'm hoping he'll still be with us at some point. He's uh, the chairman of the South African Liquor Brands Association. We were also going to be joined this evening by Lucky Ntimani uh, from the South African Liquor Traders Association. Uh, unfortunately, he has had a uh, family emergency that he's had to uh, to head off to. Um, but uh, the, uh, the point that was going to be made by Sabani was exactly that, uh, that alcohol is not the, uh, the sole reason uh, for the, the fall in numbers that, uh, for instance, the president mentioned in one of his more recent addresses. Uh, Ruben, if I can bring that, that national picture down to something a little smaller, uh, you're not just uh, an acclaimed restaurateur and uh, one of the favorite chefs of so many of us, uh, but you're also effectively the mayor of Franschuk. Uh, you, uh, you know the town so well, you've called it home for so long, you know how it works. Give us an understanding of how a small town like Franschuk, beyond just your restaurant, has been impacted by this ban. Uh, the wine farms, people who work for those wine farms, uh, has France just ground to a halt? Yes, Dan. I mean, I think we one of many uh, towns down here in the Western Cape that's obviously reliant on tourism. And, um, you know, with tourism, uh, like what has been discussed uh, on this panel now is that, you know, wine plays a big part in that as well. I mean, this town is a, basically a ghost town now. Um, you know, we've had the, uh, uh, the wine tram that's been very successful for many years. Um, and yes, after that first uh, uh, ban, it, I, I saw it sort of just, uh, I think they took their time a little bit before they opened up again. But it definitely uh, attracts a hell of a lot of people to Franchuk. Uh, it gives a certain buzz to the town as well. And, uh, you know, there's just one element uh, that has caused this town. I mean, if you go through uh, town now, normally this time of the year, it's buzzing. The restaurants uh, are mostly full. People are struggling to get into restaurants if they didn't book. Now there's none of that. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, you've got the wine farms. Uh, we've got one of our restaurants up at Chamonix as well. I mean, obviously, there's nothing going on there. Um, and many of these, uh, not just the farms itself, but the wine tasting rooms are, are obviously closed. I mean, they can't stay open. At Chamonix, where we are involved, I mean, they I think they've let most of those people go. Um, the guest houses, um, I've had some friends that wanted to come over and stay over. Uh, some of them are just completely closed uh, for X amount of time because obviously there's just not enough feet at the moment. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we on this little group, uh, um, our chefs and some of the uh, guest house owners as well. And yeah, I mean, I have to say, I'm, uh, and I'm, I'm talking to myself here as well, I'm surprised that we've survived so far. Um, and I don't know how long many of us will be able to, to, to get through this because all the businesses obviously are impacted by that, not just the, the, the tourism businesses, but the businesses that also relies on uh, business uh, coming from our side, restaurant mm -hmm. side. Um, so, I mean, unfortunately, we haven't done sort of any sort of impact study on especially our, our workforce, but I can tell you um, it's going to be detrimental. I mean, it's uh, the reality is even if the alcohol ban comes back, it doesn't just mean that we can re-employ everyone and, and there we go and everything is fine. It doesn't work like that. Um, it's going to take much longer. And the reality is also the virus is still with us um and uh, obviously we're going to have to then uh, refocus and target the local market and see how we can can sort of get them to come back to front and to come and spend their money but it's not going to be that easy it, it certainly won't but it, it needs to happen it needs to happen soon in some way or another uh you're not a doctor you're not a scientist if i if i want medical opinion i, I just need to go to facebook where i'll find plenty of it <laughs> but if i ask you from the perspective of a restaurant owner do you feel comfortable that there is a middle ground between where you would have been 18 months ago with queues outside your restaurants and uh, people trying for weeks to get bookings and where we are today where there's almost nothing happening can you find a space where you feel it's comfortable to still have people to still serve them a glass of wine and still feel that their health will be protected and that they're going to be okay yes dan i, I i've seen I, I would definitely feel comfortable and i have to say i mean even amongst uh, restauranteurs, uh, you know, 
we were talking to, to each other all the time to make sure that we adhere to all the regulations, that we follow follow the rules. Um, uh, many of us, uh, even after the first lockdown, I mean, the reality is we didn't make any money. We could keep our businesses going, maybe, yes, just to stay out there and stay sort of relevant, and then you could even uh, pay the salaries of your staff. So I think all of us uh, would be more than willing to to sort of go for a middle ground where we can continue operating until we can get rid of this virus, but but a complete ban on, on alcohol as it is now on top of the curfew. I think we, we even sort of um, worked our way around the curfew. Um, and, you know, like many things, I think our customers were, were getting around to it as well. Yes, we just have to get the food out quicker. But uh, yeah, people want to go out and then if they can feel safe in an environment, and I think most of us in, in the restaurant industry, we were, we were um, all making sure that that does happen. Uh, I'll be all for that if we can get to that again. Lest this come across as simply a long session of bashing the government over the head with blunt objects, uh, I'll make very clear, I'm very glad I'm not the president of the country. I certainly uh, want that job. It's an enormously difficult one. But it's really hard not to get the sense that this is a part of the broader approach that hasn't been given as much thought and as much time as it needed to in admittedly difficult times. It does bring us down a little. So let's try and find a reason to uh, get a flicker of a smile on the face. Uh, Siobhan, I think I was reading this morning, a document came out, some numbers, a 7.7% year on year increase in South Africa's exports around the world. I think that's largely due to my mother, who's very dedicated to consumption thereof. <laughs> it would seem to back up what has been a real sense I've got on the interactions I've had with wine sellers and wine distributors in other parts of the world, that the South African wine story overseas has been the one beneficiary of this lockdown. And we are seeing more people engaging with buying, discovering and enjoying South African mm. wine. I think that's that's very true, Dan. Just to to correct the figures, um, South African wine exports for this year was actually flat. So there was there was slightly down, one percent down. But that figure you quoted was actually growth in value, which I think is fantastic. Um, yes, there was some exchange rate influence in there, but what it really showed is that the wine that we were exporting was probably at a higher price tier than 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 the sort of equivalent of last year. And I think going back to the support, what, what happened to us during the five-week ban was we slowly, well, we're not slowly, very quickly realized that we were going to start losing shelf space. Um, and in, in effect, we did. Um, wine wasn't there to put on the shelves. And when we opened up, we had a terrible problem with the ports as well. Um, not enough staff, not enough ships coming in to take the stock. So we very quickly thought of how do we get support um, and generate um, top of mind awareness of South African wine. And that's where we started to look at campaigns called Spectacular South Africa. In fact, we did one with you and still probably are, Dan, um, the wine tribes with Hanford, um, at Hanford's in the UK, where buyers and, and trade were supporting South African wine, putting together way to promotions. Our teams were putting out social media and really trying to get uh, people to rally around South African wine, talk about it, buy it and share it with friends. And I had a wonderful story of a lady in Germany who had never been to South Africa, but she knew of um, South African uh, people or had friends who had South African friends. And she insisted that a friend of hers only had South African, have South African wine for a wedding in Germany, which I think was amazing because she really felt sorry for what was for us in terms of what was going on. So I think these sort of promotions and, and getting behind Brand South Africa really helped us. I think it brought people into the category probably would not have tried South African wine um, and they're sharing it now with their friends and they're drinking it. So I do think it's about looking at different ways of doing things. I think this challenged us, it challenged my team overseas to, to really try and find ways to support South African wine. And I think one of the great initiatives at home was um, Save South African Wine, where the industry, you know, restaurants, wine farms, staff all got together and started to do campaigns around South, Save South African Wine. And that's a website that they've put up now. And that's really had great following and it's, and it's really helped people understand what's going on in South Africa and support South Africa. So I always believe the glass needs to be half full. I would really prefer a full glass of wine, but let's always try and keep optimistic. And I think that's what happened. And it really helped pick up 
the exports. Um, we were way behind at the end of May, and I think from July upwards, July onwards, we started to see that the um, exports improving. Um, so there is there's a little bit of sunshine in all of this. Have you found over the last year or so a lot more of our wine brands, our estates, our farms engaging with wines of South Africa, trying to find ways to market, trying to find ways of getting out there? And uh, for those who are watching or involved in the industry who maybe haven't done that yet, well, what is the key? What is that first step forward to realizing we're, we're really struggling at home? How do we try and spread our uh, nets a little wider? Yeah, it's, it, I think that that a lot of the wine producers did jump on board. You know, we had such fantastic support when we called for uh, social media clips and videos and content for our spectacular South Africa campaign. And they got on board and they shared and they looked at ways of, of talking to buyers and importers, um, online tastings. And I think there was a huge amount of enthusiasm. It's 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 so typical of South Africans. You know, there's an Afrikaans saying a boer marker plan. Well, this was the case. Everyone just got on and said, we've got to do this. We've got to support you. So they came on board. We got a lot of calls from, from brands also looking for new importers um, in various countries. And, uh, you know, Westgrow, one of the partners we work with, they were fantastic. They've set up a portal that people can sort of uh, match with each other. So you've got importers you could sign up and you've got wine farms you could sign up and see where they meet. And does one want to take on the other one's brand? So I think it is really about partnerships and 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 joint activity, and I think that's where the producers have been fantastic. And my word of advice to them is just look at different ways of doing things. You know, use your social media, use virtual forums, communicate as much as possible. I do think that that our partners out in the world, the trade um, and the importers, need us to talk to them, and and share content and share. The things we're doing because they they can't get you they can't get that stimulation um and i think they appreciate that you and your team have done a terrific job and i know you work on fairly threadbare resources which makes it all the more impressive uh, rico looking at exactly that story getting the wine out how much has it eased the situation of our wine estates uh, being ha having that conduit to an outside market and is it something that you're uh, members that the, the the people you represent are looking at more actively and are really trying to to push out to, to find those new markets. Uh, Dan, absolutely. Look, I think I think one need to realise that the, that the business models of these uh, wine farms differ. Some of them are more exposed uh, internationally. Some of them local. Um, yeah, I, I think um, what I told uh, Siobhan uh, yesterday, I said what, what was to me what was enlightening about the export challenge is because we, we sat on this pressure build up on stock, uh, the worst thing that could have happened is that South Africa uh, started dumping wine internationally, bulk wine specifically, and, and, and almost um, uh, making... <laughs> undoing five or ten years work and and i think that didn't happen which which is which is fantastic it means that we are sticking to our price point um and that we that we work with a plan i think i think there's been fantastic support internationally so so yes dan i think i think the export uh, is something that people are looking it's not that easy because um with the, the on on consumption closed in Europe specific. It is not as if there isn't a lot of wine going around in Europe as well. Um, so prices internationally is under pressure. But but I, I I do hope. I mean, we were lucky to get up to 319 million liters. It's still well short of where we historically exported. We, we've exported uh, more than 400. There's been a year where we exported more than 500. So I'm, I'm fairly bullish with a focused and, and hopefully an open Cape Town Harbour, and I'm speaking on, uh, on Siobhan's hand here, that, that we could uh, have bigger volume uh, growth with value um that'll be fantastic if i've got one wish for 2021 but the reality is that unless we get the tourism and the restaurants and the local domestic market open it's going to be it's going to be very difficult for these farms to to survive and just one thing that i want to add to siobhan's comment you know what's been what's been really amazing is the level of innovation that's gone around and, and someone made the comment to say on on e-commerce, which was something which was really like 2% of sales. 
what has happened in this year is that we have really fast tracked almost six or seven years um, uh, in the way we deal now with virtual and tastings. And, uh, and I think I want to commend our marketers and our wine forms for, for, for what they do and how they do it. So, so yeah, we can talk a little bit about the stock. We've got a harvest coming in and tanks full of wine, but uh, let me leave it at that first for now. All right. Well, let me uh, let me interrupt my questioning with questioning from uh, somebody watching. What a number of people watching? A Daryl Balfour's in Botswana, where there is still an alcohol ban going on. Good evening, all from Gaborone. Says Daryl, watching on YouTube, regular viewer of ours. Uh, Pepper Pringle, this is a brilliant and much needed discussion. Glad you're enjoying it, Pepper. Uh, and then a question from uh, Joanne Boerter. Uh, Do you believe that if the wine industry had gone ahead with its court case to government during the last lockdown? Would this second ban have happened? I know the ban was lifted a few days before the court date, but as for the smoking ban, they continued their fight and cigarettes haven't been banned this time around. Uh, Rico, thoughts on that? Yeah, I've got I've got thoughts on that. Look, at just, just perspective on the court case. It was a court case that was made by by uh, three specific wine farms in the, in the Pretoria High Court. I think that was lodged in July last year. And it dealt specifically with uh, what they call tabled wine. So it's a very specific segment. Um, uh, I'm not convinced that the threat of the court case ultimately um, let government lift the ban. I, I think um, being on the inside all along, I, I think we've committed to a number of other things. Um, and the track record on court cases isn't that positive. Um, the, the challenge for alcohol, and I I'll, I'll can talk a little bit about the legal aspects, the challenge for alcohol versus tobacco is that alcohol is inked in under, I think, Clause 27 of the Disaster Act as a mechanism that, that, that government is allowed to use versus tobacco. Perspective, I think the one case that everybody refers to is the BATSA, the BAT case, where the court, uh, the court ultimately uh, gave it in favour of BAT. But you'll also know that um, that um, in the Z Zuma um, appealed that case, which means it is it is pretty much in limbo. Mm -hmm. So no, I I um, I'm not convinced. SA, SA Breweries has lodged a case, um, and we as as Vinpro are at the moment studying some legal advice. Um, and our concern, Dan, is really that there might be a third and a fourth and a fifth wave. And I hope I'm not, that's not right. But we can't afford to go open and close and open and close all the time. I think, I think there need to be a different arrangement around that. So, yeah, uh, the answer to the question is no, I don't think so. It is a tricky one, though. And again, I don't, uh, just another area I don't envy people having to deal with. And uh, there is, of course, also the, fact that uh, when you do launch that sort of court case, it is generally remembered by those people you launch it against who have a big say in how you operate. So it does make it particularly complicated. Uh, Ruben, uh, we know it's not going to be flick a switch and everything is all right. And uh, suddenly we're, we're back to where we were 18, 24 months ago. Um, but for you, how much longer do you think uh, you, the industry, can survive in this current space? And uh, if not going right back to open 24 hours a day, uh, sell by whatever you want, but w what's a happy medium for you in the in the short to medium term future as a restaurateur? Well, Dan, if it continues like it is now with the alcohol ban, uh, I mean, I don't want to be even more pessimistic and throw the, um, the current situation that we have uh, with load shedding in there as well. <laughs> but um, it's not, um, yeah, I wouldn't, I, I think we really struggle to to even keep going past sort of end of February. I mean, and that's a stretch already, uh, uh, especially with the way it's going at the moment. I mean, I, I, I would think there's a bit of a lull at the moment as, uh, you know, the locals are going back to work and, and they'll sort of get back to normal again. And they they want to come out yes people are still coming out over weekends but really not in significant numbers um and yeah i think the happy medium for us would be if um i mean even if there's certain level of restrictions uh, uh you know around the the sort of uh, uh alcohol ban i mean 
if they sort of uh, if, if it could be limited i think there could be many things that could be done but a uh, complete total alcohol ban it's just not it, it's just not viable for us i mean that's a big part of um a big percentage uh of of our turnover um and yeah i mean if dining out is a cultural thing people want to enjoy good food with good wine um we've tried i know there's many other products on the market alcohol free products i'm not dissing them at all but it all comes down to what our customers want and i mean they're telling us you know they don't like that um so if it continues the way it is now i think you you mentioned it already a few restaurants that that's closing down i think we're going to see much, a lot more of that if it if it continues the way it continues now in order to get things open Ruben, we need to to, to find a way to, to give a little from the side of the alcohol industry uh, and to try and persuade government uh, that the problem is not as great or as contributing a factor as they make out you'll be well aware of the problems alcohol can inflict on particularly a small community like Francia, where we tend to see the glitz and glamour of the big restaurants and the uh, the five star guest houses. But there is very much another side to both the town and the impact alcohol has on that type of community. Uh, how much of an issue is it is, and what do we as an alcohol industry need to do to address that to ensure that we can talk honestly about it being a, a safe, well managed, well governed space? Well, then I think if the if Obviously, the government and uh, the industry itself um, uh, put some money behind uh, educational programs. I think that would help a hell of a lot. But also, I think up the policing. I mean, um, uh, we have certain laws within our country, and I think that just needs to be policed better. Um, I think as it is now, I feel, I mean, and I, I really don't want to be negative, Dan, but it's, it, we sometimes feel that it's easier to police us than uh, to police that side. And I think education is important, and I think we can, can all get behind that. But uh, I really firmly believe that uh, better policing, um, uh, especially, I mean, where you can buy alcohol, who, you, who can buy alcohol. I mean, uh, uh, under 18 year old can't come into my restaurant and buy wine. It's not possible. Um, how well that's policed elsewhere, I don't know. So I think um, those two things would, would go very far to to sort this problem out. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard not to think of that and the, the need for positive social intervention in this space and think that that might be a, a better use of time than arresting surfers on deserted beaches. And that is <laughs> a discussion for another time. Uh, Siobhan, when we look around the world, we see our wine going out and very, very happily so. It's going out to markets where countries, where governments have not made the decision that we've made here in South Africa. Uh, and so it says to us, well, Clearly, you, you can have alcohol sold in society and not be in conflict with COVID uh, arrangements. From from what you've seen in the, in the big markets internationally, what can we learn from from what they're doing, from where our wine is going out and can be sold that we can bring into South Africa and be able to say to government, we're mirroring Germany, we're mirroring America, we're mirroring the UK. Maybe not always the best COVID examples, but but what they're doing that, that we can possibly bring back home to South Africa. I think that's that's quite a good question, Dan. Um, a lot of a lot of the markets have obviously um, gone into lockdown, so people can't socialise. If they do, they've got to socialise in that little term called a bubble, so like three family bubbles or two family bubbles. Um, so I think that automatically uh, stops the um, banding together of people and drinking and obviously getting out of control. People are consuming alcohol in their, in their own homes. They're buying online. They're buying from supermarkets. There is a restriction a restriction on, on trade, um, but I think that varies by, from country to country. You know, the USA, you can go and sit at a restaurant. You can drink wine. You have to be outside and those sort of things. So I think it's about... Um, you know, and, and Ruben mentioned as well, it's a, it's a, it, there's a halfway station. It's about moderation. It's the way you do it. Um, if there is a curfew, if you cannot all meet together in the park or, or at an event or at a tavern, then, then probably the behavior will be a lot different. But if you can consume at home and you have a limited amount, I think it, it, it should be allowed. Um, it also goes back to the education part of it. You know, the, how much of the population are is causing the issue with alcohol? The majority are not, um, and I think that's the way it needs to be looked at. And that's how you're seeing it being being looked at uh, in in markets like the UK, Germany, USA, Canada. 
Um, so there's a certain amount of control on it, um, but allowing people to make that those purchases to, and take it home and consume. And I think that's definitely what Rico mentioned, the growth yeah. of online wine has, has been huge. Um, you know, people are buying um, and they are consuming. So I think that's where the wins are, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, please jump in. No, sorry, just to just to, to jump in. I mean, so 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 as an industry, and I mean, in the, this morning again, um, we we did a presentation, and I, I think we are realistic in our expectations. We we understand the dilemma government faces, and therefore we've we've got a view on under what should be allowed under level three, um, and level two and level one, and and uh, and we still believe that the, the the curfew is very important in the way we manage this, but. But to open up, for example, now in the Western Cape, where hospitals are, are, are coming down to, to more acceptable levels, we're not out of the woods. But our, but our ask would be open the regulated channel Monday to Thursday from normal trading hours, nine till six. Um, and for wine farms, allow tastings over weekend um, and, and, and then obviously to, to buy wine to take home. I, I think that's that's something that could be policed. Um, we will probably open 50% of the volume by doing that. And it would counter the Ill illegal illicit trade and the, and the toxic concoction. So so once again, Ruben said it, I think it's it's the policing that, that's sometimes missing. But I think there is an understanding that there is a low risk um, a, a approach that could be taken. And then I've got a very specific view that decision making should be should be down to provincial level. I do think that that premiers of provinces are far better uh, positioned to gauge their hospitals and their economy and their ground levels. And and therefore, I still think that if Western Cape is at an acceptable hospital level, it should uh, not be uh, uh, read in terms of hot spots. It should be there should be some leeway. And, uh, and I think that's what we are contesting at the moment. Um, from an industry perspective, I think we are focusing on four things. So we are focusing on binge drinking, focusing on youth, which is a challenge. We're focusing on uh, drinking and driving and gender violence. And I think we the industry doesn't always get credit or airtime around so many programs and to more than 200 million rand going into these things. So just context that there are a lot of things happening and there is um, middle ground on uh, on this who, who wouldn't uh, be a knee jerk. And I think it's important to highlight those particularly in the gloom and just to, to start selling wine, even if it is online, getting home deliveries, that's mm. providing syntax from those sales at a time when there are talks of tax hikes to fund a vaccine. It, it really does seem uh, to be a step that is long overdue being taken and being looked at properly. Uh, a number of people watching, sending in either comments or questions. Uh, Grant Souls, we're here and ready to support South African wines and restaurants. Stay strong, guys. We're all drowning, but hang in there, proudly South African. Uh, thank you, Grant. Uh, Helen Nicol, my dear mum, who represents 11% of all wine <laughs> consumption in Northern Ireland. Very interesting, timely discussion. We'll do our best to continue to support. Uh, and then a few questions. Uh, one of them for you, Ruben, uh, from uh, uh, Joanne Burt. Uh, uh, I wanted to know if you think South African's restaurant industry is better or worse off than other countries, such as the UK, America, or those in Europe. Look, I think we're definitely worse off because we just at the moment are not getting any assistance from, from government. Uh, you know, assistance um, uh, and by meaning of there's no communication, there's basically nothing. In the UK, I know most of those um, uh, staff of restaurants, uh, I think they've been furloughed. So a lot of them are still getting uh, an income. I mean, a lot of us can can really say it's. Uh, we might be able to do different things to get by, but it's really, it's really our our staff and the people that work for us that we all have to care for. And and I mean, these are like our family, so we we do care for them. Um, and uh, from government side, there's just no assistance. So yes, in the US and in the, in the UK, I think uh, from government level, there's definitely assistance for them, uh, and and definitely not here in South Africa. And that, I'm afraid, applies to so many industries across the country that really is under the whip economically. 
and uh, our wine industry a big part of that. A uh, question for you, uh, Rico, from uh, Heidi Trollope, a concern. What about the farmers, the producers? What is the impact on them? The starting point of the value chain, they supply the sellers, don't get an income, and therefore might not be able to pay for the grapes received. Who is assisting the farmers to recover those input costs? We might lose farmers and one day might not be able to enjoy a glass of wine. It's a very real concern. We've got so many people who don't make their own wine, but they supply the grapes that make such fantastic wine. You've got many, many things to deal with. This is but one of them. Uh, what is the approach there? Is there, is there help for people like that? Then unfortunately not. And once again, to Ruben's point, there is no um, there is no um, direct support for the for the farmers, and and and, and I want to say the workers. Um, we we tend to forget. We talk about generations of South African farmers, three hundred and sixty years, but you've got seven gen seventh generation farm worker families on these farms as well, and it, it is a challenge. Um, we did a number, um, and, and the number is scary. We, we, we've, we've said that we could lose 60 to 80 of our wineries, and we could lose 300 producers. And, and so when I say structural change, it, it means that we might have a far smaller um, wine industry. People would either go out of business, or people would just decide it's better to plant citrus or, or do other things. And um, in a lot of cases, it would be some of our premium vineyards that would be uprooted for, for other things. So, so we so we're doing our best um, to assist them. Um, a lot of people are calling for an, a ban on excise or a revolt on excise. Um, unfortunately, uh, for wine, it's only when you sell the wine domestically that there is an ex excise mm. levy to be paid. So, to to have a ban on excise is not going to help. Uh, it's for spirits, brandy, it's it's helpful. So, Heidi, very, very good point. Um, we tend to talk a lot about the product, but we forget that uh, these vineyards need to be maintained. Um, I think there's a good harvest due, Dan, positive. I think it's a good quality harvest that's due. Um, we're going to have to balance the intake of the harvest. Um, we're going to do a lot of strange things this year. We're going to kind of take a hundred million liters of juice and make concentrate for fruit beverages. We making hand sanitizer out of, out of grapes and a lot of other things to just get rid of the surplus. But, but those options, while it, it addresses the volume, it doesn't, it's not profitable. Um, so, if the ban is not lifted on the 15th of February, I, I fear that we might find that there will be grapes left hanging in vineyards um, because we will just not have enough tank uh, tank capacity to take that in. And I think that's bad short term, um, but it's even worse long term because it would mean that we will not be able to make the sufficient quantity that we want to release in 2022 and 23 and go forth. So, so it is. Uh, it's got a ripple effect. And um, but yeah, uh, very valid point. The producers. It's where it all starts. You are watching a very special edition of Dan Really Likes Wine called How to Make You Really Depressed About the Wine Industry. And I think we've been incredibly <laughs> successful on it. And so I want to change tack violently just before we wrap up because we're we're almost at an end of what's well, been a fascinating uh, uh, discussion, albeit one with a, a fairly dark streak of realism about where we find ourselves in the industry. Uh, I'd like to ask all three of you, and a reminder, we were going to have five guests, unfortunately, uh, Sibani Nadi and Lakin Timani uh, both had to withdraw on short notice and weren't able to join us uh, from the Liquor Traders Association, Liquor Brand Owners Association, respectively. But uh, three terrific guests nonetheless. And I'll, I'll ask all of you the same question, kicking off with you, Ruben. Uh, a two part question. First of all, uh, give me a reason to smile about the wine industry. I don't know what it is, but find one for me and then tell me when we get to the 16th of February and fingers crossed. We can go out and buy a bottle of wine at Pick and Pay. What would be your number one bottle of wine to be going shopping for? So the same question to all three of you, uh, but Ruben, kicking off for you, put a smile on my face somehow, and then tell me what that bottle of wine is you're going shopping for. Well, Dan, that's pretty easy, man. I mean, uh, the reality is we have the best wine in the world. Um, it's the most beautiful country in the world. And I mean, uh, what better place to taste amazing wine than in this beautiful country of ours? And I've got to mention the people as well. And what would it be um, uh, if the weather is still continue, continuing like this? 
uh, I love uh, a beautiful uh, Chenin Blanc. Um, and I think uh, one of my favorites uh, uh, from uh, Avondale in Pau, it's really mm. lately one of my favorites. So uh, I would choose that one. All right, a good call. I uh, make some lovely wine and also have lovely hats on the people who make the wine out at, uh, at Avondale. All right, so a great people making great wine. That is definitely a reason to smile. Uh, Siobhan, first of all, cheer me up and then tell me what you're shopping for. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, mine, mine is pretty similar. What better can you have in terms of such a sunny, wonderful country with world-class wines and magic people? I, I absolutely love the people in the wine industry. So that's and, and, and they're always so positive, no matter what's hitting them. So what will I go shopping for? I'm a bubbly girl, so we need to celebrate here. I would go for a Silverthorne Green Man. Ooh, a lovely choice. Some of Robertson's finest and celebrating 50 years of Cup Classique in South Africa. So uh, uh, subliminal marketing being done there by the boss <laughs> of wines in South Africa. Uh, Rico, uh, who's probably washing, uh, using his wine to wash down Prozac on a daily basis. Uh, can, he, can even the MD of Vinpro find a reason to smile? And, uh, and then what are you going to be pouring to celebrate the end of the prohibition? Dan, I'm going to take a leaf out of the, the Americans. They had a very similar discussion last week and they said, well, they went back in history. Uh, after the Second World War and uh, post the uh, recession and depression, the history tells us they, they were huge celebrations for weeks. Um, and the consumption of wine, responsibly so, was very high. So, so the story I'm going to sell is that if we ultimately get beyond COVID, which we will as a collective, I foresee that uh, the tanks and tanks that we have full of wine will not be enough because we will have festivities in the streets and elsewhere. Um, so that's my that's my positive smile story for now um, because we are resilient and we're going to get beyond this. Um, Dan, I, your, your second question is always difficult for me because um, I, 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 I should be careful, but... Um, I, I actually had a bottle of Rex Chenin Blanc from Pierre Ball last week, which was brilliant. So I'm going to head off to Tolbach in, in my choice, and that will probably be my, my choice for now. <laughs> You're going to have a very happy Ina Smith, who I suspect will be uh, uh, sending you a message very, very shortly in the couple of tenons and some bubbles. More importantly, all three of them are South African wine, and all three of them relate to the three reasons that Ruben, Rico, and Siobhan have given us to try and find just a little cheer in what are really challenging times. Uh, guys, thank you uh, to all three of you. Uh, I hope to have you back on the show again soon, but I hope in very different circumstances, celebratory circumstances as we take steps forward. Uh, Ruben, uh, long overdue eating your food, uh, even longer overdue taking money off the golf course, which generally helps put my kids through school. So hopefully back down to Pearl Valley soon for <laughs> food, wine, and golf. Uh, you're in an industry that's battling, Ruben, uh, but uh, uh, you're still somehow managing to smile. So uh, uh, keep going, keep that up. Uh, Siobhan, uh, thank you to everything you and Wines of South Africa have done. Uh, it's been a monumental effort. And uh, I put, as I've said this many times, I put wine and sport in the same category for South Africa, it's where we consistently overachieve and over deliver around the world. And thank you for the role that you play there. Uh, and Rico, good luck. I'm not sure how you're looking as young and healthy as you are after the year or so you've been through, uh, but to you and our wine community, we know what you're going through. We feel for you, we sympathize, we support you, uh, and we love the work you do and the wine you produce dearly. And we just hope that come the 15th of February, it's goodbye prohibition and a big step back in the right direction. So, uh, Rico, Ruben, Siobhan, thank you so much for joining. Dan thank really you. likes wine. Uh, <laughs> keep strong, keep fighting, and uh, keep celebrating South African wine. I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Dan, for everything you do for us. Cheers, Dan. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, Dan. So there we go. Uh, three wonderful people in the wine industry who continue to do so much uh, to fight this battle. And thank you to everybody who has commented, who's contributed. I see a whole lot of people in the last little while. Uh, uh, Kath Jerikaris, uh, the great Greek winemaker of Parkhurst, uh, chipping in there. Kath, great to have you with us. Uh, Ina Smith, uh, thanking Ruben for his Shannon choice. Uh, Kathy Rath, uh, supporting the Avondale Shannon. 
and uh, Angela Lloyd. Uh, excellent choice, Siobhan. Love the silver thorn green man. I think Angela frequently has that for breakfast. Uh, so thank you all for supporting. And I can only ask you, and I, I don't think I need to really if you are watching this show, but but keep supporting South African wine. Keep getting your friends abroad uh, to get behind it and to buy it. It's a wonderful industry. And as Ruben illustrated through his restaurants, as Rico spoke about uh, through the, uh, the people who uh, are involved in the value chain of wine, and as Siobhan highlighted from the people who benefit from wine being sold around the world, it is such, such an important industry to South Africa. We need sales to start again, even if it is just online, even if it is just off-site, off-consumption. And we also need to get our wine tourists back to get people into those wine estates and to help kickstart an economy that we all know all too well is very family on the back foot. Yes, we know COVID's a big problem. Yes, we understand the severity of the situation. We all have friends who have lost their lives or been seriously, seriously ill because of this, uh, but that doesn't mean that we need to completely rule out getting an industry back on its feet that contributes so much to the country. And it does so proudly, it does so successfully, it does so with some of the finest wine in the world. I'm signing off with a glass of Semillon from my good friend Rob Armstrong out at Hotel Spa. Whatever you are drinking, and I hope you've still got a bottle or two left, raise that glass to an industry that is trying its very best all on the back foot to keep going, and that hopefully from the 16th of February gets back on its feet properly. Big thank you to all of you. Appreciate the time. And join us again on Monday, our next live show, which will include Jim Clark from Wines of South Africa in America, talking to us about the market there. And currently online, a wonderful interview with Garth Ferreira. Gareth Ferreira from Core Restaurant in London, one of the world's top sommeliers, who just happens to be South African. Proudly South African, drinking loads of wine. Take care. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.